right, we've reached the halfway point of the NFL season. Week 9 has gone. Here we are, Arizona, birds chirping. We're outside of Chelsea's Kitchen in Arcadia, Phoenix, Arizona. We got ribeye tacos. Uh, we got a veg veggie enchilada. We got nachos with chicken. Ahi tuna flown in daily. My favorite. Gluten-free, because I'm watching my gluten. I want to make sure my stomach stays... No bloating. Thin, but green chili cornbread. Unbelievable spread. Got a little old-fashioned to kind of get the hair growing back on the chest, but what a week, huh? Cheers, brother. Cheers. I mean, you can't forget the homemade tortillas, too. Homemade tortillas. Thanks to Masa Fresca, the local company here that they get all of it from. Uh, this is one of my favorite neighborhood restaurants. We both live in the area here, and man, when this was on the list, uh, hands down, my favorite cocktail in the whole valley, Let's right go. here, Diego Let's Rivera. Go. Every time I come here, it is what I get. Every time I come here, I get the nachos. Our family loves it. This is a special day. I love it. We got an interview coming up later with Alex Boone, electric personality, electric teammate, incredible football player, played at one of the highest levels you could ask for as a guard in the NFL for over a decade. Um, we got a lot going on. We got some teams really making some noise. Who do you see at this point as the favorite? Does Josh Allen's injury bring the Buffalo Bills down a notch? Unquestionably, right? Because he is the run game, right? They, okay. they try to make changes. Who knows what's going to happen, right? Uh, hopefully he can come back. But a UCL injury is nothing to take lightly on your throwing hand. And I'm sure he's going to try and tough it out. If he can't go, that's why they went out and made a trade for Case Keenum. They have Matt Barkley on the roster. They can weather the storm, but they are far cry from who they are going to be if you take Josh Allen off of that offense and off of that team. That hit looked ugly, man. I mean, I saw – listen, you see, like, balls get hit at the end of a play, right? But when you see that arm and full whip do that, it's like, oh, man, I hope I hope the best. Play. You're right, and we've seen it before, right? Guys can go out and finish games like, well, if you can throw the ball as far as he did to end the game, then he can still go out and play. No, adrenaline – you know, all of these things, when that pain, that soreness, all of that sets in, it's a whole different mindset. And, and you just don't know. And, and hopefully he can play. Hopefully it's something minor. If it's not, though, you got to be smart. That is the franchise moving forward. And if you've got to take a step back and say, this year, it's not worth it for the longevity of his career. We saw some records Sunday. 100,000 passing. Yeah. Can, can we even talk about that? Is that Will that ever... Never. It'll never get tough. I mean, how many miles is that? I'm not a mathematician, but like that's. I mean, we're going to Mars, right? Let's yeah. Go to, let's go to Mars. Well, I mean, not Mars. I mean, maybe, not. maybe take you to Tempe, but. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's impressive. I mean, that's yeah. so impressive. Props to Tom. We were both teammates of his. I mean, he's, he's the greatest to ever play the game. He's the greatest to ever touch leather. And it's such a monumental achievement. So awesome for him. I know he doesn't give a shit about that. All he cares about is winning and getting his team into the dance. But, man, that is cool. Justin Fields, 178 yards rushing. That'll get broken. That'll get broken. With, with the way and the athlete that you're seeing play quarterback, that'll get broken by somebody. I mean, there's there's four or five quarterbacks you can rattle off right now in the NFL that might break it next week. So that could change. But you also don't see somebody as committed to the run game as you see the Chicago Bears offense, right? They are on pace to set an NFL record for rushing yards in a season. And, and that's a great point. I think it's I think it's so awesome to see because you don't see it often. You don't see teams. It's not sexy. Well, and you also don't see teams take what they do because most coordinators do what they do. Like, I hate that saying, hey, we do what we do, right? But they were going that route. They get a bye week and they come out and they're a different offense. They they adjusted to their personnel. They adjusted to what he does best. And now they're actually look like a pretty good team. Like, yeah. this is a team that five weeks ago, I'm fucking, I'm betting against them every week. And now it's like, I look, I went through it today and I'm like, I'm not touching that game. I'm not touching that game. <laughs> I don't feel as good about it. Yeah, I I mean, feel, yeah, exactly. Exactly. The leadership. And again, he's trying to find his way. Bill Parcells used to always tell the coaches that I were around. It takes three years to see what you've got in a player. And they need time to develop, especially within their own position, how they can fit in your scheme. We've talked about all this stuff. The patience isn't there in this league. This is a knee-jerk reaction with a lot of teams in this league because they want instantaneous results. That's not going to happen all overnight for some of these guys. It's going to take a little bit more time. 
They just don't usually have the luxury of doing it. Justin Fields, we're starting to see him get comfortable with who he is and what that can be. Yes, he's going to be in harm's way, running the football, doing all these things. But at the same time, if that gives you the best chance to win week in and week out, that is a calculated risk that you have to be willing to take as the Chicago Bears are. Tyreek Hill has over 1,100 yards received. I mean, it's a, that's insane. It's insane. Does, first of all, does he hit 2,000 yards receiving? Yes. Is that all time? Is that would that be would that no. be an all time record? Somebody has no. over two thousand. Calvin. Calvin does. Okay. Will he break Calvin's record? He could. I don't know what Calvin's at. I mean, we probably. I don't know. I, I don't know the exact number, but through nine games, nobody's had more, and he's got an extra game. And to think, Waddle's having an incredible year. Gasecki's having an incredible year, right? Like it's not like they're just focusing in on just him. It's not. He's not the only offense. They got a good running game. This is all happening within the offense, which yeah. is insane to think about. You need two number one wide receivers to be able to do something like that. And Jalen Waddle takes that pressure off him because you can't do that. The other thing is, is you see Tyreek Hill play, he plays so much bigger than his frame, right? A guy like Antonio Brown comes to mind of a guy that you can throw up a 50-50 ball to, and it's not a 50-50 ball at that point. You feel really good about coming down with the football, and he does it consistently, right? That's what we see. That's why he's doing that on top of his ability to catch and run. So it's special to see all of those things. These are teams that are moving in the right direction. They're all doing something right. A team that's not. They made a change at the head coach position, right? There, there's a lot of turmoil. A lot of people are upset. Probably even in the coaching circle and ring of saying, Jeff, Saturday? And then he says, Parks Frazier is going to call the plays. This guy's 30 years old. Two years ago, he was assistant to the head coach. You know what the assistant to the head coach does? He literally does whatever the head coach wants him to do. Hey, you want me? can you go get me coffee? Can you go get the schedule? Can you go talk to the boys? Can you go do this? Can you go do that? It's really nothing football at all. Now, you're, you're going to gain football stuff just from watching, but that's what he was doing in this league two years ago. And now he's calling plays with Sam Ellinger at the helm against the Vegas Raiders. A team in which Jeff Saturday just not too long ago Bashed. tweeted out, Raiders are horrible. It's, Look, it's, I don't think that, that that's not any locker room fodder or anything like that. No, but Nobody cares. It is, but it's his opinion. He was working for ESPN, sure. right? He, sure. he was given his opinion based off of what's going on. And I'm pretty sure that Jeff Saturday would still contend they're a bad football team. They are who they are at this point in regards to what they've put on tape, what that offense has looked like. They get rolling, they jump out to a huge lead, and then all of a sudden it evaporates, and they go away from the best wide receiver in this league that they finally found some success with, and they go away from him. Listen, if this was an Indianapolis Colts team that had a quarterback in place, a good quarterback They in have place, two. They're just not playing them. Agree. But a good quarterback in place that they were going to play with that defense, with some of that skill, with that offensive line playing well, and Jeff Saturday gets named the, the head coach of this team. I'm pumped. Because now he does well. This opens up the door for a lot of us that don't want to go through what I went through of getting pictures taken of me fixing fucking copy machines, right? Long six months of coaching. Long six months of coaching, right? Like, I feel like we have so much more to offer as opposed to that and drawing cards and doing all these things. And so Jeff is in a situation now, a position where he can really set some things up, hopefully, for former players where – you don't have to have that resume of working your way up and putting your time in and all this old adage that we say in coaching. So I really hope this goes well. I really do. Look, and there's no reason to say that it can't, right? This is a division that, that is not great, right? There's plenty of margin to be able to make up this differential the second half of the season. And I still contend, right? Just because you're a great play caller doesn't make you a head coach. Just because you're a great head coach doesn't make you a great play caller. If you know the game, if you know how to hold people accountable, if you are a leader of men, you can be a good head coach. Jeff Saturday has all of these things. Now, is it directly correlated to what he's done as his coaching experience in the NFL? No, absolutely not. But at this point, right, once you fire the head coach and you deviate from that plan, Everything is on the table at that point. So go get a guy that's in the ring of honor. I know there's been a lot of jokes about, hey, he walked in the stadium and was like, Peyton, no. Oh, Jeff Saturday, let's call him. Jeff Saturday held people accountable in that locker room. He did it at a high, high level. And again, he knows what it means to have that horseshoe on the side of your helmet. He knows what that means. There's a lot to be said for that. The pride of that organization, you and I have been in that locker room. We've been a part of that organization 
that owner cares about the product. He cares about everybody in that building. And that can't be said for every organization. He said it. Since 2000, they're in the upper quartile, the upper quartile. He said it, all right? He don't know how to make sausages. Yeah. But he knows how to make a football team, all right? Well, so, you got the sheriff. So you don't have Peyton or Andrew at the helm right now, boss. So we got to go get one of those guys, I think, moving forward. And who knows if this is just a... 10 week trial period for Jeff but we can we can only hope uh, we can only hope this goes really well for them. All right, let's do let's do something a little different this week. We're ha- we're at the halfway point. There's teams and a lot of a lot of teams are in this position. They're they're at a point where they can either go up or down, right? We're going to call this sink or swim, right? So we'll just kind of just roll out a bunch of teams that either have been good or really good right now, stink right now. Which way is the arrow point? Which way are we going? LA Rams. I think they're going to get figured out. They're getting a little bit more healthy. Disagree completely. They're sinking and sinking fast. They're swimming. Okay. Fair Arizona Cardinals. Sinking. I think they're sinking too, and, I th- and I'm going to make a bold prediction. I looked at the rest of their schedule. There's a solid chance they go. They, they could very easily go 5-12. Look, I, you know, I, I cover this team. I understand this team. There's a lot of things they got to get figured out, and they just need leadership to step up and do it. Can it get turned around? Yes. Will it get turned around? I don't know. One thing I think about is extremely important is the offensive line, and they are in shambles up front. they got to get that figured out. San, San Fr- Francisco. Yeah, San Francisco. They got it figured out up front, and they got it figured out with a nice trade pickup. McCaffrey. Swim. Weapon. They are swimming. <laughs> ah, stop the train. <laughs> Seattle Seahawks. This is, now, when I'm, we say sink or swim, we're saying either make the playoffs or miss the playoffs. Yeah, exactly. Seattle's making the playoffs. They're swimming. You don't think San Francisco catches them? And I, I, I don't. I think there's two out of that division. I think it's those two. You got to look at the NFC East. Still think it's two Cow- out of that division. Cowboys, Giants. Still think it's two out of that division. Okay. Because there's seven now. Right. I still think it's. I, th- I think there's two out of that division. Uh, Chicago. They're gonna get figured out. Sink. Sink for sure. <laughs> Green Bay Packers sink for sure. They got no chance. Too many injuries. Not enough playmakers. Aaron's out there trying to do this thing on his own. He can't. As, as good as he is, nobody can do it on their own. Sink. New York Jets. Sink. I think the quarterback, right? I think their defense, the culture, all that's great, right? They did a tremendous job of going it's gonna on the It's going to be road. close with them. Yeah. Because they're good. They're good. They're, they're good. a lot better. I, I, I'm with you there. I'm going to go sink as well. Miami Dolphins swimming for sure. They are swimming. They are they're fucking They're doggy. dolphins. What do you expect? They're doggy they're paddling. Dolphins. Let's go. They got to swim. I agree. New England Patriots. They're going to miss the playoffs. I'm going swim. Okay. Swim. They're going to be swimming. I, they, look, just them stepping on the field, right, and looking at the games they have remaining, especially if Josh Allen is not able to play for the Bills, that division becomes – a little bit more wide open in regards to what's going on. Yeah. And again, in the AFC, who's going to really step up? You talk about all those playoff spots that are available. That's yep. just a team that's kind of faded early. People ripped them off, and now they're kind of just systematically. Mac Jones is kind of putting it back together. They're a, they're a work in progress, but defensively, they're always going to be capable of holding teams at bay. All right, a couple of disagreements so far. I like this. Tennessee Titans are swimming. They're winning the AFC South. They're moving forward. Mike Rabel's a dog, and their group up front of dogs. And Derrick Henry's awesome. They're treading water right now. They're treading water until Tannehill gets back. If Tannehill comes back, they are swimming. If he doesn't, they're sitting there. I can't tread water. I'm an awful swimmer. So, But Malik Willis, again, once you take a team and make them that one-dimensional, you just knew that Kansas City was going to find a way to win, as good as they were defensively. Agree. But I – I, I do love this team, and I think they're in a weak division. I think they – The weakest. The weakest. Denver Broncos are kicking themselves. The fact that they got five years and 200-plus million invested in a guy that I'm not even so sure they believe in right now. And they got a group around them that I'm not sure they believe in. And this team is sinking and sinking fast this year. Yeah, I mean, they, they sold off Bradley Chubb, right? They, they kind of played their hand a little bit in saying what's going on. They're They're in – a still very good division, what we thought was going to be one of the best divisions. I mean, Kansas City is still my pick to go on and win the Super Bowl. Uh, that is the team, and you look at what they have with Patrick Mahomes, how special he is, 
how he can bring everything and pull it all together. I mean, you know, with what Kansas City's doing, I think the Chargers are going to always kind of be in it because, again, what they can do offensively, they got to find some ways to navigate some health issues. But I think Denver's done. Baltimore Ravens, only team in the NFL this year to have double-digit leads in a game, in every game this season. Love what they do. Love they also Greg lost Roman. those double-digit leads. Agree. They've had three bad losses, which they got to get that figured out, but they've also got some really good wins this year. Mm-hmm. And they are going to continue to win. They're the kings of the AFC North moving forward. They are swimming. You don't think Cincy catches them? They're swimming. Yeah, I mean, they're... They're making it. Yeah. Um, New York Giants. This is a team. This is an interesting team. I like this team. I like the culture that De- Dayball... Is that you said? Yep. That Dayball has brought to this group. I love what Wink Martindale's doing on defense. They've had some injuries that they've kind of fought through, and they're still winning games. I don't know if they have enough this year. Sink. Yeah, I'm saying sink as well. Washington Commandos, Commanders, whatever you want to call them. Do you have underwear on? Uh, yeah, I do. So I you're not saying. Commando right I'm now. not, though. but they stink. They are sinking. Might as well put a fucking, what do you call those things, uh, anchor. Might as well put an anchor on the end. Put them at the bottom. I would have said so a couple weeks ago, but with Taylor Heineke, there's something about him that that team just loves. Again, I, I don't think they make the playoffs, but I think they do show enough growth. Why are you so talking trouble. about quarterbacks? That fucking D-line is what's got them going. Payne and Jonathan Allen. Scary. And Sweat are awesome. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, okay, perfect. Just and Chase Young's coming the back. Boys. And Chase Young's coming back. I, I, I don't think he's the answer, but let's keep it moving. Atlanta Falcons, they are sinking. Tom Brady will figure this out. They're, they're in a tide for the division lead they're right they're now. Up, but there's only going to be one from that division. You love Arthur Smith. I do. I love Arthur. You love, I love Cordell Arthur. Patterson. I love Cordell Patterson. I love everything about that team except their quarterback. Okay. Sink. I think they sink too. Good. New Orleans Saints sink and Andy Dalton's not the answer. Jameis Winston's not the answer. They should have went with Taysom Hill three weeks ago and just figured out. If they go with Taysom Hill. They got a chance. It could be interesting because that defense, right, getting healthy, they get P.J. Williams back. They're starting – they just threw a shutout. Granted, it was against the Raiders, but I don't care. You shut somebody out in the NFL, you are doing something right. And then they look fucking abysmal against the Ravens. But the Ravens' run game is unbelievable. Ravens are are one of the best teams in the AFC. I agree, but they looked abysmal at home. Don't like it. Don't like it. Tampa Bay Bucks. They're going to swim. I I was going to say sing. They're going to swim. Because they're the better of a bad division. Their defense will keep them in it. Tom will figure it out and do enough like he did last week. And you see vintage Tom bring them back. Two great drives. They get the drop from Scotty. Really should have took the lead with three minutes left. And then they get the one with ten seconds left. They're swimming. Yep, they'll swim just because of who they get to get in the pool with. Yep, exactly. Cincinnati, they are swimming. The team that – but they. I will say this. There has to be a contingency on this. The team that showed up against the Carolina Panthers, I understand the Carolina Panthers are bad, but when you're measuring the Carolina Panthers' defense, they're pretty good, and they looked awesome. Mixon got it rolling, five touchdowns. I mean, that's a team. They, they are so talented. If so they talented. can get it figured out, which, again, it, it takes a little bit of time. You miss Jamar Chase, and you can still put up that kind of a day. I think they swim. Cleveland Browns love the run game. Two edge guys can really wreck the game on offense. Run game's incredible. Offensive line's incredible. Quarterback's average at best. Week 11, though. Week 11. Week 11, you get the guy that you paid the house to. I mean, just. You gave gave everything up for him. He hasn't played in two years. Who knows what he's going to bring? Will they be who they paid him to be? Will he take seven games to figure it out? It doesn't look like it in preseason. I'm going to say sink this year. We'll see about next year. Yeah, the only thing that matters is this year. Sink. Sink. All right, we got some uh, we got some injury news. We got some bad injury news this week, leading on leading into the backup plan. Rashawn Gary, who's actually had a great year, he's come on. Everybody, great player. Great player. But I think slow start to his career. They had Preston Smith, they had Darius Smith. Um. Wasn't really called upon to be the full-time guy until this year, and he's six, seven sacks. I mean, he was top five in the league in sacks. Yeah. And you lose him to an ACL halfway through the year. It sucks because their defense was actually doing some good things. Um, 
I don't know who's going to come in for him. Do you know who's going to come in for him? Yes. Talk to me. Their rookie that they drafted in the fifth round, which is hard to replace. He's got two sacks on the year. Okay. He's still doing a good job. Kingsley Anegbre, I believe is how you pronounce it. Okay. Um, it's going to be interesting. It's a huge void to fill, right? When you try it and plug Can't it. Fill it. Yeah, I mean, but not only the, the level of play on the field, but that leadership component of him stepping in there of what that means for a team that's still trying to figure out who they are, right? There's, the yeah, there's a lot of questions, right? When you lose games like that, right, and the way that they've lost games, five in a row, six in a row, whatever it is since five, London, yeah. you know, and so you start to question everything, and then now now you start to get the division, and where does the division start? We start to point fingers. Who do we point fingers at? Well, defense is not doing what it's done in years past, so here we are, and – They've given up a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of stuff, and they're they're literally pointing fingers at the defensive coordinator, and that you cannot have. Nope. So that's kind of where they're at. So will they figure this out? Will they pick it up moving forward? Will they do any of this? Lord knows. Yep. Well, a team that has to figure out coming off the bye because you have a centerpiece, you know, a, a guy. Look, you go on a break, you have a bye. You always give the speech as a head coach, and Brian Dable probably gave it. Don't go out and do anything that's stupid that's going to hurt this Don't team. be the guy. Don't be the guy. Xavier McKinney played every single snap for him, goes down to Cabo, and join, goes on an ATV, has to get surgery on his fingers. He's out now, right? And why that's so important? He wears the green dot. The green dot on the back of your helmet. Explain with you. Yeah, explain that. Yeah, the green dot on the back of your helmet, it just lets everybody know on the field because you're only allowed to have one green dot. That's the coach to quarterback or the communication between the coach and the player on the field. He is the one that has to relay all of the calls. It's imperative that you are comfortable in doing that, that you know how to do that. So now you're going to have a new guy out there. You're also going to take a first-round pick off the field that's playing very, very well for you. Like I said, he played every single snap. How you fill that role because you're going to switch the green dot guy, obviously, to Julian Love, who was the opposite starter, that can make that calls, who can do all those things. But now you're plugging in a fourth-round pick or a fifth-round pick. Obviously, the pedigree is completely different. The chemistry of that secondary matters so much. And that's one of the reasons why I think this team, these little things start to creep in that you will see the New York Giants kind of fade back to the median. I do think, though, with Wink Martindale, this is a team that can hide some of that. Like, I think he is that good as a D coordinator. As a safety position, though? Yeah, I think you can protect that a little bit. I think you can protect that. I think you can go to some single high stuff. Protect that. Blitz. Now, your corners are going to be put in some disadvantageous positions, I'm sure, based on this. But you got a good front. You hope that they can get home. I mean, Dexter Lawrence is playing out of his mind right now, right? So yeah. they got some guys up front. And so I think that's a group that you might be able to hide that. I, I do think it's a huge loss. I think how bad of a phone call that is. Hey, Coach. Coach. Looking forward to getting back from the bye, but here's the deal. I went down to Cabo, and I fucking shattered my hand. So, well, you did what? Yeah. You, you did what? Like, I mean, that's a horrible phone call to have. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those situations you hope they get it figured out. But I agree with you. I, I, don't, think, I don't think they're so deep and talented that they're going to be able to just kind of get away with a bunch of these moves. Safeties are so hard to find good ones, right? When you have a good safety, it's just reassuring. Hence the name of the position. Yeah. They're called safeties for a reason. They are a safety valve of that defense. The, the Arizona Cardinals safety valve has been Buda Baker. As many Pro Bowls as he's had there, everything he's been able to do, he has been a constant on that defense over the entire tenure that he's been there. So in saying that, it just came out, he's going to miss two to three weeks. That is a huge hit for a team that has to win this weekend. They have to go up against a team that they have not had great success against. I think they're, they've are they lost 11 out of 12 versus Sean McVay. Wow. Yeah, I mean. That's, I think the last win was when we were there in the old Coliseum. Yeah, Sean it McVay's was. first year. It was, yeah. Jared Goff. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, man, we put a beat down on them at the end of the year. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that, it was exactly. So, in saying that, you take off Buda Baker – Jalen Thompson's still a great safety. I think he's on his way to being a Pro Bowl caliber that he just got re-upped. I'm a huge fan of Jalen Thompson and what he does. Agree. But now you're talking about replacing him with Chris Banjo, who has been in the league for a long time, 
just a special teams guy, really, right? That, that's terrifying when what they do so good, they're trying to find their identity, again, of establishing their run because that's what the Los Angeles Rams need to do. Missed tackles are something we have not seen from this defense from the safety position. Chris Banjo versus Buda Baker, two vastly different players. Buda Baker is one of my favorite all-time players to watch. He plays the game the right way. He comes downhill like a freight train. He plays the game the old school way, like, hey, I'm coming down and you are going to feel what I'm bringing. Huge loss. The issue that I've seen with the Arizona Cardinals over the past couple of years is they try and fill backup spots with veteran guys that have been in the league a long time, right? You, you look at the group on defense, who their backups are, and it's your Zeke Turner, it's your Tanner Vallejo, it's your Chris Banjos, right? Like, these are guys who have been on a couple other teams, and now they've found comfort in Arizona as backups. But when you get sprung into that starting role, I'm not necessarily sure those guys are the ones, like they're great special teams guys. They're great kind of locker room backup type guys, but are they backup guys that can get you out of games as starters? I'm not so sure. I think they need to start kind of trying to, to draft and move through that process and get some younger guys that – can develop and do all that thing, but I think this is gonna be a this is gonna be a big loss. This is gonna, this is, of the ones we're talking about this week, this is gonna be the biggest one. Ooh, no, it's not. Okay, Josh Allen. Yeah, but he might play. Okay, but if he doesn't, if he doesn't, it's a big loss. It's a huge loss. I mean, you loss. look at what this team does, and no disrespect to Case Keenum, the identity changes completely if Josh Allen can't play. This is the biggest backup plan that we'll have to see, because you're not talking about like a high ankle sprain or something like that that you're going to come back from right away. You're talking about a guy's elbow, his throwing elbow, and being able to go out there and play at a high level. It is a scary, scary thing that could go a lot of different ways. And if you don't have him, everybody in that locker room is like, he's, I mean, he, he was up for MVP. He's up for, uh, he was as good as it gets at that position throughout the duration of this year. And now all of a sudden, it's a lot of pressure on Case Keenum to try and fill the, that role. Now, that's why you sign a veteran guy, because he's going to go out and be himself. He's not going to be Josh Allen. But the offense is going to change for Ken Dorsey. Oh, there's no question. There's no question. I mean, Case can't run fucking 29 quarterback. <laughs> like, he can't do that. He can't sit there and see the safety rolls down to the three-by side when you got the nub tight end over here and check to a quarterback man play to, the, to yeah. the boundary. Like, that's not happening. You're not going 55 yards with Case Keenum for a touchdown, right? So, agree that. I mean, I... I agree. I'm just also looking at that in the glass half full realm of he's going to manage this. It's going to be a one game thing, if that, because I do think he's tough as nails. I think he's only missed a handful of games. And again, it was like a UCL thing back his rookie year, I think. So he'll get this thing figured out, hopefully, and that team will continue to kind of thrive. Hopefully. Let's go into some, some quotes. I think we have some good ones. There were some really good ones from a lot of different areas yeah. of a franchise. Yeah. So we'll start with a place that you and I, this is where our friendship started, Indianapolis. Jim Irsay. Unbelievable press conference. I mean, maybe, I mean, he had 22 quotes we could take from that. He was just on it. Yeah. The whole night, right? And so the biggest one we'll, that we think, right, we'll hit this one first. This is what Jim had to say. And he hasn't learned the fear that's in this league. That's because it's tough for all our coaches. They're afraid. They go to analytics, and it gets difficult. I mean, he doesn't have all that. Hey, the fact that Jim is literally taking a shot at every single team, basically, every, in the yeah. league, including his former head coach that sits there, because Frank Reich was a big go-for-it-on-fourth-down analytics guy, right? And so... The rest of these teams are all looking to analytics analytics for all of these answers. And the fact that he says he doesn't think it's a big deal that Jeff has never coached and that he's not going to be afraid yeah. because of the analytics thing, that, that's a huge statement. I mean, that's a huge statement. Well, I think it speaks volumes, right, because some of these coaches are afraid, right? They try to minimize risk through analytics, yeah. right? You've got to be able to do that. And I said before, early in the show, Jeff Saturday hasn't been exposed to that. Todd Haley always used to say, you can't live in your fears as a coach or as a player, yep. right? Yep. A lot of these coaches do because they are afraid to make mistakes. It's almost like when you've got something good going, you just don't want to lose it. Well, Jeff Saturday didn't have anything going, right? Yeah. And for Jim Ursay to sit up there and say it, I absolutely love it because he's breaking away from the norm. And when you're the owner, 
When you're one of 32 guys that calls every single shot for your squad, you do whatever you want, and everybody else falls in line within that organization. And it's clear he's making the shots. He also said that Chris Ballard, is, he didn't say safe, but he, he, he basically came out and said that. Mm-hmm. That could be a complete fucking lie. Like, in eight weeks, he could fire Chris Ballard. So, Jim's making the calls. He's calling the shots. Crazy, crazy press conference. Crazy to make this move. Kind of love it. Just hate the situation for Jeff. I would just love to, like, what is Jeff Saturday going to walk into the team meeting room and say to start that off? I mean, he just met the other assistant coaches yesterday. So, it's tough. It's tough. Jalen Ramsey comes out and says that the defense shouldn't have had to come back on the field, right? Let's listen to what Jalen had to say. Not have went, had to go back on the field. You gotta have some dogs who gonna go get it. Be like, like we shouldn't come to the sideline after a big stop like that. And and our coaches or the other side or whoever telling us, man, y'all, we gonna need y'all one more time. We gonna need y'all one more time. Like, what the? F- we just we made a big stop, turnover on downs with with a minute and some change left and and no timeouts for for nobody. You gotta have some dogs. It's like, man, f- all that. We gonna we gonna end this game right now. Jalen has a point, right? They get a huge, huge turnover on downs there, right? Yes, there was a drop included in all of that. But in saying that, right, with that much time left, you can't get conservative. You know who's on the other side of the ball. That third down call was so ridiculous. You don't even give yourself a chance to convert. I would be pissed if I was Jalen Ramsey. I'd be pissed if I was everybody else. You just did everything you could to defend every single blade of grass. You have this mastermind as an offensive coordinator. And those are the best plays you put on the field to try and ice it? In comparison, right? Because we're all talking about four-minute offense at this point, right? Being able to have ball control but be creative in it. Not just line up and just say, okay, we're going to try and run and run and run. We know how good that run defense is, especially when Todd Bowles knows the run is coming. Mm -hmm. That was an awful sequence of plays there. You take on the flip side, Seattle, right? They're in a situation where they're trying to go out and win a football game. Set up everything they've done before. Shift, motion, motion run play action, play action drag for 60, 60 yards, flip the field, game over, take everything that is possible and steal the soul of the Arizona Cardinals and take that game. They were aggressive on first down, which is so important to be in this league because you can make some of that up. You also tell the quarterback, if it's not open, try and get what you can get and get down. Keep the clock running, right? All of these things. As soon as they punted that ball, I was like, oh man, right? They, they didn't go out and try and win a game. They tried not to lose a game. And when you do that, you're going to lose a game. Yeah, there's no question about that. And it's funny, I saw, I saw the diagram yesterday. And it, I, this is complete coach speak, so just hear I me mean, out. you're a former coach. So just hear me former out. Former coach. Having said all of that, having said what Jalen Ramsey said, you're on the field, you have nine seconds and a couple yards, whatever it is, one yard, right? Maybe it was one yard, to defend. The corner really has no responsibility for the run in that play. And he goes inside, and you get the little boom, tight end out. I mean, it's a clear mistake, right? It's a clear mistake. He has no responsibility there. His eyes get caught in the backfield, sees this. Having said all that, like, he probably needs you, – you, you got you to be in better position as a corner there. But I agree with you. This is a guy who we've been – Lauding as the smartest coordinator in the game, right? He's the one, he's the innovator, right? He's the guy that's been figured, he's figured it out. He's been to two Super Bowls in five years and won one of them. Probably should have won the other one, to be honest. You can't just come out and just lay lay down and just say, hey, the defense is going to win this game. Because every time you do that and you give another team an opportunity, it usually comes back to bite you. It does. And reading between the lines here, Jalen Ramsey's just sticking up for his guys. Yeah, for sure. Right? He's sticking up for the guys on defense and saying, We've got to be better. He's not one to shy away from any kind of adversity or anything like that. He will take it head on. He's gotten burned. He stood up there and said, you know what? That's on me, right? That's what you want in a leader. Do they have enough to get it turned around because it doesn't get any easier from this stretch for him? Yeah. We'll see. Listen, I love Geno Smith, and I love his quote. I love his comment. I love the way he's playing. I love the fact that he's answered all the critics this year, and he continues to do it on a weekly basis. Running game helps. Defense helps. But he's doing it. Like, it's not like he's just out there managing a game. He is doing it. Geno Smith had this to say after his pick six, and this is what he had to say about it. 
trust in myself. I know what I can do. Um, like I said, I'm playing in the NFL. This is the highest level. There's players out there who are going to make great plays. Um, sometimes the ball is not going to bounce your way, but um, you can't be phased by it. And I'm, I'm pretty much, I mean, after all I've gone through, things like that are not going to phase me. First five games of the year, this defense was not the defense we're seeing as of late. Geno Smith was winning football games yeah. for them, right? Yeah. The recipe they have there, the culture we have there that exists right now in Seattle is a winning recipe because of who is at the helm. Geno Smith is comfortable with who he is. I watched that game. I was at that game. He was so decisive in his decision making. There was no hesitation, right? Yeah, you let that go, right? He gets through it. He tries to find a check down. Unbelievable play by Zayvon Collins. Unbelievable play. Comes right back out. 13 play drive for a touchdown, right? They were losing at that point, right? The Arizona Cardinals were winning 14 to 10. All of a sudden, this landslide because they just gained momentum back. Part of it was that run game. Part of it was Kenneth Walker. The other part was they converted seven third downs in a row. Some of those were long third downs, right? When you can sustain drives and you can do those things, it's not by mistake. You find this rhythm and you just unconsciously start going out there. And they're so good at situational football, they just extended the lead out and out and out and out. And then it would just felt like they could never find their footing for the Arizona Cardinals because Geno Smith is unfazed. He has been through the ringer. Sure. This is nothing. This is one play, right? You move on from it. Your body language, your demeanor as a quarterback when something like that happens, everyone's looking at you like this. Like, what's yeah. he going to do? Yeah. What's he going to do? If you unbuckle your chin strap, you throw your helmet, you yeah. go over there and sulk, everybody's like, oh, man, he oh, doesn't. We're done. Even, yeah. We're done. Stick a fork in him. Yeah. Literally. Well, that's not how he responded. Kudos to Geno Smith. He is doing it consistently week in, week out. There's a reason he is playing at a high level right now because he is comfortable with who he is and he does not care about the outside noise. We got an interview coming up with Alex Boone later and I cannot wait to hear what he says about the confidence exuding from Pete Carroll and how it permeates through that entire group. And, it, and you, you see it across the board. You see it from everybody. I also love what they're doing with 13 personnel. For those of you who don't know what 13 personnel the first number in that one says the back, three, the tight ends. They're doing a ton of stuff with this three tight end stuff, and you saw it. They do it, they get the drag to Fant. Then they go down, and they do it again. They go 13, same basic formation on the other side. They motion a guy across, then they bring him back and run power against a team that is wanting to stop the run and get another 12 down inside the 10. Like It is awesome to watch what they're doing, and Geno Smith is at the forefront of all of that. Awesome to see the young man. Young man, I say that now. He's probably the old man now in the group. Yes. It's awesome to see the confidence that he has and the way that he has answered all the critics and just kind of stepped up to the plate and done this. Well, that pick six leads into the segment of pick six. Let's do it. Zayvon Collins, great play by him. Geno Smith, weather the storm, able to go out and get a win. Where are the wins this week? I feel real good about these. Do two, you? A couple two and ones the last couple weeks. Yeah, you I looked at the break. slate initially and you're like, this week well, sucks. Well, I hate this slate of games. I think it's going to be boring to watch. But I do like my picks. I think I got three teams that got to feel good about this week. I mean, the Raiders, it's a team that needs a win. They got too much talent to continue to fucking lose. Too much talent. They cannot continue to lose with this group on paper. They can't continue to lose with this group as a coaching staff. They cannot. And they're playing a team in Indianapolis – the head coach who was a center, never a coach, on ESPN, coaching his high school football team, his son's high school football team. So he has coaching experience. Against Sam Ellinger. The Raiders have to win this game. Minus six, Raiders win. Miami Dolphins, minus three and a half versus the Cleveland Browns. I love this Miami team. I love the pickup of Jeff Wilson. Now they got basically the there are two guys from San Fran that know this team, know the offense, know the, where the cuts are, know exactly where to stick their foot in the ground to hit it north and south. Love what Tua's doing. Love the group on the outside. Defense is awesome. It is, uh, this, this game has to go to Miami. It has to. Minus three and a half Miami Dolphins. I stayed away from the international game. I don't know what people's travel schedules are. I was going to go that game, but I stayed away from it. I went with New Orleans Saints versus the Pittsburgh Steelers coming off a bye. Did Pittsburgh get things figured out? Nope, they sure didn't. New Orleans Saints get things figured out? Nope, sure didn't, but New Orleans a better team. They're going to win by two and a half in Pittsburgh. Oh, that's an ugly game. Yep, sure I like it, though. Those those are all picks could hit, and, you know, it's a roll of the dice with some of them. Uh, 
I'm going to stick with that Cleveland Miami game, but I'm going to take the over. I think this is an anytime I see the over for the Miami Dolphins, I'm like they can put that up themselves, right? I think the Cleveland run game is going to be good. Miami is leaky with their defense right now. Yes, they try to add pass rush and be able to get after the quarterback. Cleveland is so good at running the ball. Nick Chubb is so good, and I do think Jacoby Brissett is playing better football. In saying that, 49 points not enough down in Miami. The weather should be good. It'll be nice. Those guys will look forward to going down, get out of Cleveland. I think 49 points, the over hits here for sure. Tennessee minus three against the Broncos makes a ton of sense, right? You get to, even if Malik Willis is at quarterback, hopefully Ryan Tannehill is back, that gives a huge boost and even reaffirms why minus three is not enough points. This line's probably going to change the latter course of the, of the week once we figure out who it is. Even with Malik Willis, you talked about it. Derrick Henry is running with a purpose. This defense is great. They will force Russell defense into more. Defense great. Yeah. They will force Russell into turnovers. They've had to deal with some injuries, but their identity is their identity. And I love what Mike Rabel stands for. I love what he is all about. And they went neck and neck with Kansas City and yeah. should have won a football game. So minus three, Tennessee. Last one. Green Bay and Dallas. Over. I know it seems really against what's going on. 43 points, though, I feel like I don't know what the stats are, but you see the way Aaron played last week. He is chomping at the bit to get back out there. They had opportunities to put points on the board. They didn't do it, right? You look at the Dallas Cowboys. They are doing everything they need to do to run the football. Dak's back. He's comfortable. He's dispersing the ball really well. This game is going to be interesting, too, because there's a little bit of tug at the heartstrings, right? Mike McCarthy talked about going back to Green Bay where he spent all that time. Yes, he's been removed there. There's still something to be said for going back there. There's going to be a lot more points put on the board than people are giving credit for. I agree. Let's get your picks in this week. Maybe fucking parlay. Maybe six-way parlay. That's how good we feel about this. Um, it's aggressive. It might be really aggressive, but I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, we got a great, great, great interview coming up at the end of the Joining us this week, we have one of my favorite all-time teammates, from the Ohio State University, which is a fucking juggernaut in college football. Uh, played a billion years in the NFL. Was one of the best guards over the last decade. San Francisco 49ers, Minnesota Vikings, Arizona Cardinals. Finished up with a very relevant Seattle Seahawks team. Alex Boone. Thank you so much for joining us, brother. Dude, it's great to be here with you guys, both of you. I miss you both so much. You both look amazing. I'm so excited. Let's do this. Hey, uh... Seahawks, you played for them most recently. Yeah. Pete Carroll, everybody questioned him. Everybody on planet Earth questioned him whenever he let Russell walk out of that building. They revamped. They let Bobby Wagner walk out of that building. Whole new team. Geno Smith, who you had the opportunity to spend some time with. Whole new offensive line. New running back. They're killing it right now. They're, they're, they're on top of the world, and they're feeling really good right now where they're at. Tell me what makes Pete Carroll so good and what you saw in Geno Smith in the year that you were with him. Dude, Pete's the man because he is all about just having a good time. And I know that sounds super lazy and relaxed, but it's not. Like He has all of these amazing coaches around him, but he himself is always super happy and excited and positive. Like Nothing ever really phased him when I was there, and he was always like bouncing around. Like You see him on the sidelines bouncing around, you're like, that's not who he is. Every day in practice, he was bouncing around, running around, trying to race people down there. Like He's always trying to pull the best out of you. I remember the first day we get there. They're like, dude, you're in for a treat. I'm like, well, why? They're like, it's basketball day. I'm like, what the hell is basketball day? Like, they're gonna make you go up there, find the whole team. You gotta shoot free throws. I was like, what? They're like, yeah, dude. I hope you can shoot because if you're not, coach can really drill you for it. And I was like, oh my god. So we get up there. Of course, he calls me up. He's like, you versus Brian Monet, and you gotta have the shoot off, and it's 30 seconds. How many times can you shoot? And I was like, are we really at? F I never re remember BA pulling us in a room. Like, hey. Let's have some fun. Let's do some basketballs, right? Like, it wasn't like that. And so the minute I get there, you're like, dude, this is incredible. I want to come back tomorrow. And then the best part was his son was on staff, and his son is not at Arizona University. Brennan, I love him. No, like, wait till you meet his son. He's like the OC. He's crazy, dude. And I'm like, okay. So he comes in. He's wearing like a Motley Crew outfit, and he's like blasting rock music. And he's coming in on a golf cart, and everyone's like standing up screaming, and they're like all excited. And I'm like, dude, this is this is what football's supposed to be. A bunch of morons sitting around all day having a great time. But then on Sunday, 
I remember the first pregame um, speech he gave. We were sitting in the hotel, and he was talking about like all the doubters. And he was like, I'm sick of all the doubters. I'm sick of everybody doubting my friends. And I'm sick of everybody doubting this team. And I'm sick of all this. And you could just feel the emotion in the room. Like, yeah, I'm sick of it too. And like he just, the way he can grab a team, you're like, wow. I almost did some crazy things in that meeting. That was awesome. And then a game day, he's just bouncing around. Like, hey, it's not over till it's over. It's not over until I say it's over. It's not over until it hits double zeros. Like, he's just a firm believer that you're never out of it. And that's why you look at these teams. That's why they're constantly saying, like, nobody believed in us. Everybody resisted. They're just speaking exactly what Pete's telling them. Nobody believes in you, but I believe in you guys. And let's be honest. When Russ walked away, we were all like, what the fuck is going on? How are they going to let Russ walk away? But I think Pete was more like, listen, I'm more go with the flow. And if you don't want to be here and you feel like you're being resisted, then I'm just going to let you go. Like He's one of these guys that's never going to hold you back and be like, no, you need to stay here. And I feel like looking back, that was probably one of the best things he did because then the rest of the team was able to just kind of like let go and be like, you know what? He didn't want to be here. We'll roll with Gino. We believe in Gino. But what's the one thing that's making this team work so well is their run game. I mean, when you can line up and just run the ball dominantly, it opens up everything else. And it makes the whole line – it's super fun. It's awesome. Well, so my question for you, right, being a backup in this league, right, now Gino is getting an opportunity. I'm not surprised by it, seeing his makeup, seeing his personality. What have you seen in Gino that makes him as good as he is right now? I think it's his, the fact that he's so genuine. You know, when I was there, he was just a great guy to be around, super knowledgeable. When I got there, I was in his huddle right away, and he was just super like, hey, man, welcome. I'm Gino. This is the team. Let's do this. And you see it, and right away, you're like, oh, hey, what's up, man? Let's do it. And you get out there, and I, I started messing a couple of things. He's like, hey, no, it's okay. It's okay. We'll figure it out. Come over here. Let me tell you. Let me come over. And it's just like the way you're around a guy like that, and you guys know how it is. There's some guys that are like, it's my way or the highway. And then there's other guys that are like, hey. I get it. It's a learning curve. Come over here. Let me help you. Let me teach you some things. And just the fact that outside of the meetings, he's talking to everybody and being around everybody. I mean, we all know Gino's a great guy. But to take over this team and the turmoil that they had, I think it really shows his leadership. And the fact that everybody was counting them out, and now he's kind of got them revved up again. It's like, dude, maybe he was a better quarterback than people gave him credit for. Yeah. When I first met you, I hated you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I first met you, I was like, this guy is such a hard-on. And then, you know what? I got in the huddle with you, and I gave you an opportunity. You showed up, and you saw Blaine, you're like, chest bumping and all this stuff. And yes. Like, Who is this guy right now? I know he went to Ohio State. I know he thinks he's got the world by the balls. But I will never forget playing with you, and that's when I was like, I love this guy through and through. I remember we went out to dinner one time, much like we do with our segment, right? And we're sitting there, and you're like, let's order everything on the menu. Let's do this. Let's do it big. And I was like, this dude is such a meathead. But then we get on the field, right? And I absolutely loved playing with you. And I didn't get to play that much with you. But then at that point, right, when you are in the thick of it with somebody, you see their true colors come through. You see what yeah. you get in somebody. And I think that's what we're seeing with Gina, right? You hit the nail on the head by saying he's genuine. He's authentic. And that's what I've tried to tell all these young guys when you come in the league. Once you step out on that field, that's only you 11. And then whatever that looks like, right? And, and that's when I just absolutely fell in love with who you were as a player, with how you played the game, right? That mean streak of like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then I was always like, wait, what's the snap count? What's the snap count? What's the snap count? I mean, I never had a guy ask me to snap. It's on one again, Booner. Booner, it's on one. Hey, hey, Aaron Donald, hey, it's on one here, just so you know. Just like, hey, I, I didn't I think I was, up. listen, I was so baffled that they kept calling 76. I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that Aaron Donald in three technique cues? Like, you're damn right it is, bro. Good luck. <laughs> I will never forget. Snap down. Yeah. 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 yeah, I will never forget though. Right, we get done with that install protection meeting, and it was your first time playing against the Rams. And you're like, "Wait, we don't we don't slide to Aaron. We don't we, have a, we don't have a plan for this we, guy. We don't have a plan for him." But yeah, he's like, "Nope, next man up." You're like, "Oh, whoa, 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 timeout, timeout, timeout." The whole game became seventy six and sixty two. I was like, "Please God, somebody." Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Hey, so let's stay on that topic, right, Aaron Donald. Yeah. You played against him a bunch. I played against him a bunch. I have my feelings. You obviously have your feelings. Our feelings echo the rest of the fucking world. He's arguably the greatest to ever do it. For sure. Do you see anything that he does differently than everybody else, or is he just more talented? Is he quicker? Like, what? What? What is it that makes him so good? Number one is his mindset. I know you've played him several times, and being a guy that played him a ton, he never talked shit. 
ever. Have you ever noticed that? Like he was Here's very like killer, quiet, right? Like, right? Like he just look at you like, dude, I'm, I'm, yeah. You'd yeah. be like, what the fuck is he looking at? Yeah. Like, what you'd be like a soul. Fuck? You'd be like, oh boy, he's coming today. But what does he do that's so good? Number one, his hand placement is ridiculous. He can get your hands. And a lot of times, if you notice, he's always getting underneath guys constantly. Like, how about in the like, I forget who they played last week, but I'm watching it. And somebody oh, pissed Tampa him off. Bay. And, Tampa, Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay. He like points at the center. He's like, you, you're dead. Oh, Next I'm play, just. Oh, yeah. Like, you're just like, dude. Yeah. How? But you know what it is? It's the fact that he's always moving forward. Have you ever watched his feet? He never stops. And what's our job as an O-line? Once I hit you, it's to stop your feet because then you have to get going again. He never stops. His feet are always continuously moving forward. So when you hit him, you're still having to move with him. Like You're like, wait, wait, this guy's this one's not stopping. Why is he continually going up there? And then he just keeps pressuring you all around the edge. And at the same time, the minute you think he's going to go outside, he hits you with that bull rush. And you're like, I'm probably not afraid of it until he hits you with it. And you're like, okay, I'm not sure where the Mack truck's hiding in him, but there's something in there that's not right because he's strong as shit. I've said that too. I've said that a bunch. And people don't realize that it's when you watch defense alignment and they go to make their move and swipe hands, their feet stop because they open their hips. He's the only person I've ever seen that continues to keep working upfield while doing that. I agree with you 100%. And you know it's funny, too, because the one time we were blocking him, I blinked, and he went inside, and I was like, where did he go? And I saw my center just eating a full face of it, and I was like, oh, man, that sucks. I got to go out here. See you, buddy. <laughs> I was like, I'm out here. Know. Dude, it was not you. I swear, I swear it was not you. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I, I bet. It was not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads into another great question, because AQ and I, one of the segments we always talk about is the backup plan, right? And having a backup plan of, like, when somebody has to step up, right? How important is it to have continuity on the offensive line? We see these offensive line coaches that do a great job of coaching, but sometimes, right, the continuity that exists of having the same, not even five guys, because I think that's unrealistic in today's time, but to be able to have continuity with the center, to be able to have continuity with guys, how important was that for you when you were playing? Oh, it was huge. My guy, Q knows the whole line were my guys. And I think that's the one thing that we're seeing nowadays is that guys aren't as close as they used to be. I mean, I remember a time when we all hung out all the time. And like to come into the old line room was a sacred thing. Like we had to let people in. Like people would try to walk in, you'd be like, get out now. Because that was our space. And it was like you would see five guys go out and fight together. Now you see individuals going out and they're, yeah, they're playing well at times, but they're, they're, the one thing that people don't know is, and Q, you know this better than anybody, is we all play on the same plane. Like if you're off, line at all like if, if i'm deeper than you or you're deeper than me all of a sudden things aren't going to gel as well as they should the run game the fits aren't going to be right the pass game people are going to be leaking through you see it everywhere number one is because guys are lazy and they're not trying as hard as they used to i mean there was a time where you would come in that room and they would throw a chair at you like dude how dare you give that up that's some bullshit are you serious you are so much better than you guys that you're right now it's like listen brian you are so much better than this we need you please and it's like dude at some point, you have to go back to what we used to do. And I'll give you the best example. I'm not going to name this team. But there was a team that came together in OTAs, and they went to their coach, and they were like, listen, if we put one pad on this year, we're out. So the team was like, okay, cool. No pads for OTAs. We'll just walk through everything. The team started like 0 3 There's a reason that you have to go out and grind every day. There's a reason that old lines used to go out and we used to practice 5-0s all day. You had spare time, you were practicing pass trails. You were practicing run fits. Now they don't do that anymore. They got to get back to how it used to be. Well, and I've got an observation that I, I, I don't know how I came about this, right? But I don't know if it's accurate and I want to ask, I haven't even actually brought this up with Q. I think as soon as the rival ratings came out and every high school offensive lineman was worried about what his star rating was, AQ Shipley did not have a high star rating. Did you? Was the star system out there? Yeah, I think I did, actually. Okay. Oh, 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 but, oh. but here's the thing. It was to play defense, Booner. It was to oh, play defense. There we go, right? Oh. So I think that part of the problem with these offensive linemen, like you're saying, they're out there for themselves because they're saying, I'm a five-star recruit. I'm going to go here, and I'm going to start, and I this is my path of least resistance to go to the NFL. Do you think there's any merit to that? Can I tell people, like, hey, like, the offensive line star rating, Rivals.com messed up a lot of these young guys because they're, they're not about it for everybody else, where that is the most important position group on the field. And you see that because if you can establish a line of scrimmage with those five guys, like you said, being on the same plane, it's so imperative. 
Oh, absolutely. Do I think the star system's wrong? Absolutely. I think that you, Q and I could look at a guy who's probably considered a first rounder and be like, this kid's going to get drafted. Wait, what? Like, it's just, it's because when you're looking at it, you're, how does he fit into the team? I don't ever looked at a left tackle like he's by himself. I always look at him in the left guard. What are they doing? How do they handle twists? How do they handle switch offs? All these things. How do they do in the run game? There's a lot of things that go into this. And that's why some guys that come out look amazing. And then they go into these systems that they, number one, don't belong in or don't understand. And you're like, what the hell just happened to this guy? He was dominating in college. And then he goes to the pros. Oh, yeah, by the way, he's playing against a 35 year old too, who's out here to make money for his family. Like, Everything changes. So the minute you jump into this team dynamic of professional sports and grown men, dude, everything is out the window, and you have to fit more into a team. So I agree with you. So I, I talk about this a lot. I talk about Furster. Are we going to talk about Furster no, right we're, now? We're not Man right. crush? I know Boone is a big fan of Furster, Furster but here's the deal. We're going to oh. we're gonna go a little bit about <laughs> schemes and talk about – because I talk about this all the time, how important it is, right? Like – if you're a zone scheme guy and you go to a gap team, like you're not good, like you may be one of the best players in the world in a zone scheme and go and get your head beat in in a gap scheme and vice versa, right? So yeah. just talk a little bit about how scheming around your personnel up front can really, really help out an offensive line based on what their strengths are. I, I'll give you the best example, Kyle Shanahan. And Kyle's always pissed me off, but I love him to death because every time I was a free agent, I always wanted to play for him. I swear I did. I had my agent call his team first, like, hey, listen, I want to go to Kyle because he just seems so innovative so from the beginning. And they were always like, he's too big and he's more of a mauler. And I would always be really crushed by that. Like, I was like, I can run off the ball too, though. They just don't let me. And so, but it was like, I got put into this box of like, hey, this guy runs power better than anybody. Him and Mike, they, they love it. But it was more like, it's just how we were built. We were built as fighters. We're more maulers. We like to keep it condensed in the middle, right? Like we had Frank Gore who loved to run between the tackles. He hated cutting it outside. So it was like, hey, if we can get these big, brute, stout guys that can't really run that well, but if you tell them to go fight in a phone booth, they'll move people out of the way. Like that's why Giro was like, this is going to work so well. And then the minute you turn around and you say, well, what happens if you're smaller and you can really run off the ball? Well, then you would fit into more of a Kyle Shanahan zone run team. Like you said, Chris Furster loves people running off the ball. You don't need to be very big in these because at some point it's all about angles. We're just getting people running. I want to see the three technique run all the way to that sideline and the next play is going to run all the way to that sideline. And at the same time, if the mic gets out of position at all, well, they're screwed. You are in so much trouble. It's more like... We're going to let you beat yourselves as opposed to we're going to come attack you. And that's why I think that a lot of these teams are starting to they're doing a better job of finding who they want. And I'll give you the best example. Cincinnati drafted a kid in our gym, and he's a mauler. But they're a mauling team because they have Joe Mixon. Like, that's what they do. They like to run it between the tackles. So they were like, hey, we need more maulers. Let's get – and so now you see guys that are starting to say, like, oh, you know what? They don't fit into this system that well. We're going to cut him loose, and he'll, but he'll end up somewhere else and be fine. Just to be clear, g Row is Greg Roman. Greg Roman. Yes, and I heard his run game is absolutely insane. Like, from a quarterback's perspective, right? Terod Taylor was with him and said, the run game is more sophisticated than the actual pass game, which blows my mind. So fun, guys. Like, you would plus plus people on certain situations. So, like, it was the mic plus the safety. And you know what? Go out one more. And you're like, can you really go out to the corner? And G-Road would be like, yeah, I want you to. I want you to take the whole offensive line that way. And then we would start to see that people would have to run so far that these lanes would become so vivid for the running backs. Or all of a sudden, the minute we'd start running this way, Cap would run this way. So it really put the safeties in a bind like, man, they're running either toss this way or Cap's tossing it to himself out this way. I mean, it was so sophisticated. And then the pass was everything off of that. So we're going to run fake power every which way, but we're going to have seam routes, and we're going to run China, and we're going to run Dancer. And it was like, dude, this is so fun. Because they didn't know if we were really running it, or Cap was just going to heave ho at 80 yards. Yeah. So is Baltimore, have, have they evolved with him? Like, are you, or when you turn on Baltimore, are you seeing the same thing that you guys used to run? Or is it, like, completely different with Lamar now? No, it's the same thing that we used to run because I know what the next phase is. He brought me in one time and was like, this is where it goes to. Because we were always like, g where does this go? Like, it's got to be next level. How do you beat them next? And yeah. he tried it in a game once. And he was like, we're going to try the next phase of this. I saw somebody run it last week again. Like, every now and then it comes up. It might have been Seattle running it. And it, the phase is you run this quarterback option, but you spread the receivers way out. Two of them at a time. 
And so you're basically telling the defense, listen, I'm either going to run it with this guy or I'm going to throw it out here based on how you cover us. And we started to do it against Seattle. But that was when they had Bobby and Irv sure. and Michael Bennett. So it was like they were like, please, we'll keep five in the box easy. We don't care. We'll spread everybody out. We were like, bad team to do this against. Okay. Plan B. Oh, we don't have a plan B? Shit. Here we go. 49 to nothing. Damn it. Like it was just, it was a rough day. Hey, this was awesome, man. We we gotta get you on more. Oh man, this was great. I oh, oh this it. this was electric. I needed this in my morning. So hey, appreciate you joining us. I know you gotta go get your workout in. I know you gotta go handle your daycare that you got over there with 14 there's, kids. There's nothing wrong with four kids. Dude, oh, there's all screaming great. at me over here in the corner. Dude, I'm like, I'm going to put yeah. cash up. Yeah, I love it. This is right. really important. This is work. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thanks so much for having me, guys. We had a great show. Pick six was good. Great quotes this week. Backup plans. We hit on who's going to sink. Swim. What do we got? We got a lot. But, hey, this was a uh, – this was another good week of the Bobbled Exchange. Thank you so much for joining us. Check us out on all YouTube, Spotify, Apple, everywhere where you can check it out. Like it, subscribe, retweet it, get it out there. Let's go. Cheers.